Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. My name is Alex of the Corporate Cowboys, and we are continuing with this audiobook of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss by Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. That's Productivity Press, the publisher, and it's from the year 2022. Ch- on to chapter three. Why do I get stuck? And now just a little side note. Keep in mind that uh, because this is more uh, practice as far as oral pronunciation and enunciation, you know, reading out loud for myself, um, you know, every every episode I'll try to uh, incorporate something different in, in my intonation, in my tempo, or my cadence. Uh, and then, you know, it's just, it's uh, professional development. So stick with me here. Uh, a couple of quotes here in the very beginning. First one is, attachment is the result of the activity of behavioral systems that have a continuing set goal, that of maintaining a specified relationship by John Bowlby. I'll repeat that one more time. Attachment is the result of the activity of behavioral behavior behavioral there you go attachment is the result of the activity of behavioral systems that have a continuing set goal that of maintaining a specified relationship by john balby the next one is there is a particular circumscribed form of melancholia that we often experience when individuals organizations or belief systems that we lean on or are dependent on for emotional support are withdrawn from us by Jerry Harvey. The last one, no one ever told me that grief felt so like fear by C.S. Lewis. Jenna moved to Washington, D.C. in October of 2018 after finishing graduate school. She was like many people Sorry, she was like many of the people who joined her consulting company. She was new to the company, new to the industry, and new to the area. On her first day of orientation, she was introduced to Joshua. They had a lot in common. They shared similar views of the world. They were both from New Jersey. They both left home for college and grad school. And they were both in serious relationships with people that were quote unquote back home. Over the next few days of orientation, Jenna and Joshua formed a quick bond. They joked about the exercises together and continued to learn more about each other. As the orientation was ending, they assumed they would find their roles and would separate into the massive 20,000 person company with just email to connect them. Instead, Jenna was relieved to learn that they were assigned to the same team and the same first project. This would allow them to continue to build their friendship over the first few tenuous months of a new company. By the spring of 2019, Jenna and Joshua were inseparable. They walked to the client site every day together. They hosted regular happy hours for their project team together. They went to the gym together and they made plans to take the train home to New Jersey on the weekends together. In the summer, Joshua got engaged and Jenna was elated. In the fall, Jenna was promoted based in good measure on Joshua's personal write-up of all of her efforts at work. They supported each other as both colleagues and friends. Uh, that's, that's, That's pretty healthy. That's borderline healthy. I like that. On March 16, 2020, over 48 million Americans attempted to do something new at the same time work from home due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Jenna and Joshua rented a car and drove back to New Jersey. They settled in with their respective significant others and hunkered down for the next year. There were no more happy hours, no more workouts. They did not share a workspace for 13 months. Yet, every morning, they got on Zoom and started working together. Over time, Joshua and his fiance decided to have a private wedding during the pandemic. Jenna and her boyfriend got engaged. Joshua was promoted based on the recommendation of Jenna and was to move to a new role in New York following the pandemic. 
Meanwhile, Jenna and her fiance jointly relocated back to DC in the spring of 2021. Even though they both were building families elsewhere, Jenna and Joshua stayed strongly connected to each other. They also stayed connected to the company. They continued to share playful jokes about things going on in the company, and they commiserated about work virtually over wine. Both were asked to move into managerial roles, and they talked regularly to share the experience and compare notes. In the spring of 2021, Josh, so oh. in the spring of 2021, Jenna was approached with a job offer from an up and coming small business where she would have a bigger role that included 25% more money, better benefits, and the opportunity for equity in the company. She rejected the offer. And when asked why by the recruiter making the offer, she simply said, I have a good social network here. Jenna was entering her third year with a company where she had spent most of that time in a virtual setting due to the pandemic. How could Jenna possibly have a social network at that company? She was being offered more money, more benefits, and more visibility. Why would she be so stuck on her current role? Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with her company per se. Maybe it was about something else. Maybe it is about something else. You know what that something else is? It's Joshua, her work hubby. <laughs> Don't get caught lacking, gentlemen or gentle ladies. If you have, uh, if your significant other has a work spouse, they will get stuck at that work for their work spouse. I mean, and it starts as friendships. You know, if you have uh, associates that you can trust. Uh, pretty much hand over fist. Like if, if you could cement trust with someone and it's a, it's a die hard trust, it's hard. It's hard to leave a workplace, especially when that quote unquote social network is there. When Jenna's social network was just Josh. See, that was a blatant lie. Jenna saying that she has a good social network when she just relies on Joshua, the one person, the work hubby, the work spouse. Anyways. That's just me rifling off. Attachment is the human need to lean on tangible and or intangible objects for support. The definition is simple. The concept is not. Attachment is biological and builds from the intuitive brain we explored in chapter two. This means that attachment is not simply a preference for something. Attachment is instinctual. Attachments form in the limbic system through a mix of memory, emotion, and learning. Let's skip ahead. Attachment to what? The intangible and intangible objects can truly be anything around us. The tangible might be people, places, or things. We connect with people and talk to them about our problems, but we can also be comforted by just knowing they are present. Likewise, we can be comforted in certain places or with certain objects, whether it is the presence of our lucky penny, quote unquote, or just having our red swing line like Milton from the movie Office Space. The red swing line is a stapler, by the way. The swing line is a, is a prominent uh, office supplies company. And Milton is, Milton is a character from the movie Office Space. The intangible objects are the ideas that we lean on for support, the concepts in our groups, organizations, communities, and countries that connect us to the larger set of people around us. These ideas might be as abstract as mission statements, or they might be more enforceable like written laws. Either way, we attach to these intangible ideas. The human need to lean on objects for support. We all need support throughout our lifetime of social interactions. As chapter two showed us, the evolutionary process helped us become socially interacting beings with a dependence on each other. But that doesn't mean it comes naturally. We still have a seeking function to find support that helps us through our daily lives. We seek that connection in all settings of our lives, including the workplace. When that connection is removed, we get stuck. 
We have an unwillingness to let the object go. It is a sense of loss due to the nature of the attachment and the depth of the connection. The depth of the connection is a direct result of the importance of that attachment. In a mild form, this sense of loss is as if something has been borrowed from us. In a deeper form, such as the loss of a loved one, it comes with the appropriate grief and fear that comes following a death. For some people, attachments form that yield a sense of loss as great as losing someone, even if it is not as severe as the actual loss. In this chapter, we will explore how does the brain get stuck? How does it connect to biology? What is attachment and how does it develop? What are some of the ways we get stuck at work? The Roots of Attachment we get stuck in the brain. Attachment is rooted in the intuitive brain, the limbic system, where memory, emotion, and learning come together to coalesce around past connections. Attachment is a concept that starts early in our lives. In fact, it starts at birth. In our early days of life, we have a connection to our original caretaker, and we form an attachment. There is certainly a physical dependency on this person for basic needs of food and cleanliness. However, a deeper connection is also forming. If we think back to chapter 2, our intuitive brain is building in the memory emotion learning core how to develop the social interactions and emotions around a single person. These feelings play, sorry, these feelings are a combination of the emotions around seeking, care, panic, and play. A newborn child is slowly but surely developing these social emotional feelings. The seeking is the basic human desire to find those for interaction, which starts from birth. Care is what the tenderness and love that is both provided and sought, which builds the formation between the infant version of ourselves and the early caretaker. Play is the positive response that emerges as we understand that we receive enjoyment from active interactions with others. Last, panic is what the infant finds when the caretaker is missing, even for a brief period. What the child feels is a real sense of loss for the missing caretaker, as John Balby notes. Whenever a young child who has the opportunity to develop an attachment to a mother figure is separated from her, he behaves in a typical sequence. First, he protests. Later, he seems to despair. And finally, he seems to become detached. A baby at a party. Separation anxiety or healthy attachment. It's a little exercise. It's in the gray box. If you think of your observations of infants, you have probably seen all these behaviors. Just imagine a six month old that comes to your house during a party. The baby comes into your home in their parents' arms. Hesitantly, the young child clings to their parent, sometimes seemingly climbing up their father's coat or their mother's sweater. What are they seeking? They just want, to, they just want the known care and comfort from their caretaker. Over time, you or one of the other people in your home might take out a small toy that introduces play. The child recognizes it as similar to the same play they have with their parents. In fact, they look back at their parents to confirm it is the play they know. The child will play for a while and even forget about their parent. They look up and notice that mom and dad went for a cup of coffee and they lose their mind. Panic sets in. The child goes back to seeking and finds the caretaker they know provides care and comfort. We are quick to call this separation anxiety. While this may be an appropriate clinical terminology for what is happening, it is, oh, sorry, let me, let me restart that. While this may be an appropriate clinical terminology for what is happening, it is at once oversimplifying and providing a negative context to an effective process. Just as, as we just saw, there were many positives to the relationship that the child formed with the parent that made it possible for a six month old 
to come into a new home and interact with a new person. The child looks to the parents for reinforcement of the social norms and even accepts that the new situation must be acceptable based on the parent's comfort. These are positives to the relationship. The oversimplification is that the child does not just miss the parent. The child does not know if the parent will come back. When the caretaker goes missing, the child lacks the understanding of object permanence to know the parents will come back. Additionally, we, are, we oversimplify with the term anxiety. Additionally, we oversimplify with the term quote unquote anxiety because the panic emotion as a social emotion is more often associated with guilt. This means the child may think they caused the parents to leave forever. Now that's daunting for a six-year-old. Over time, the child will have a series of situations where the parent leaves and comes back, which will reinforce the memory function of the limbic system to coordinate with the emotional systems to understand that the separation is temporary. Even in the healthiest of attachments, the child will still feel a sense of panic when the parent leaves, but the intensity will dissipate and the child will learn to regulate the emotion. What's happening in our brain during the attachment process? We previously mentioned long-term potentiation, that's LTP. This is how the brain physiologically forms attachments. But to understand attachments, we must understand how they form in our brain. Attachments are instinctual and evolve as a combination of memory and emotion. In this way, they are incredibly powerful because they work in the intuitive brain where all the social emotional functions reside. Therefore, they are inherently connecting to Therefore, they are inherently connected to emotions about social interactions and feelings around seeking, care, panic, and play. Attachments is, in short, a hard-wired mental model. It resides in the same place as other mental models in the intuitive brain, the limbic system, and it is formed through the same combinations of memory, emotion, and learning. Like other mental models, it is formed in the early days of life. The key difference from other mental models is that it lacks an algorithmic element to it. It is purely biological. There is little ability for the body to apply it like some of the decision-based criteria in Chapter 2. The attachment mental model in adults sits in the intuitive brain where the emotions become learned and reinforced by memory. It becomes a biological response. Throughout our lives, we move away from these original caretakers, both physically and emotionally. We attach to others and find new anchors. These emotions can develop effective attachment characteristics for children. Children come to develop a healthy dependence on parents and caretakers for their physical and psychological needs. We lean on these caretakers through our youth and developmentally difficult teenage years as the anchors to provide stability and remind us of our original comfort. As this happens, we always attempt to connect these new attachments via the same social emotional systems, seeking, care, panic, and play. And as a result, no, we always feel a sense of loss when one of these attachments ends. However, with effective attachment behavior, this sense of loss is managed and recovered effectively. Objects play a critical role in the attachment process. They are both the source of attachment in the form of the initial caretaker, and they help people regulate their emotions through the period of loss when an attachment is broken. This is why the definition of attachment includes this element of lean on objects, quote unquote, lean on objects. At the beginning of life, these objects include things like blankets and binkies, often a playful term for pacifiers. That's in parentheses. Young people, sorry, young children lean on these objects for support in separation from their parents or caretakers. As they grow up, the objects may turn into teddy bears or other beloved stuffed animals. 
For others, different behaviors may develop that serve as the comfort mechanism, such thumb sucking or nail biting as a young child. These different forms of comfort mechanisms will yield different types of attachment behavior throughout adult life. Throughout life, we can transition almost like moving across monkey bars from one object of support to another when we have an effective and secure base of attachment. Of course, we can also develop ineffective attachment behavior. As noted in chapter 2, all emotional systems have both negative negatives and extremes. As noted in chapter 2, all emotional systems have both negatives and extremes. Elements of detachment can lead to guilt, shame, anxiety, or worse, depression. As we grow into adults, we likely don't feel the same intensity of separation from our earlier attachments that we did when we were infants, but we do take some lasting tendencies with us. Two important things are formed in these early days of life. One, how we attach and respond to loss. That's attachment styles in chapter four. And two, our attachment objects. That's in chapter five. Regardless of both factors, attachment styles and attachment objects, regardless of both factors, attachment styles and attachment objects, a sense of loss can happen for anyone. It is the intensity of the loss, the emotional regulation around the, the emotional regulation around the loss, and the response that will vary based on the attachment object and the attachment style. For example, the loss of a loved one should be hard for everyone, no exceptions. For a teenager, not getting into your top choice school may vary based on the root of the attachment, the connection to the school and the way the person attaches to the situation, the attachment style. Adult, adult attachment. The characteristics of attachments continue into our adult life. The idea of attachment behavior in adults is most attributed to Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby. The two, de developmental, the two developmental psychologists, she American and he British, provided a wealth of research between 1960 and 1990 on the topics of child development and attachment, even collaborating on early books about child care. Separately and together, they pulled the thread from childhood to adult. Much of Ainsworth's research focused on the individual. She sought to identify the relationship that led to the attachment bonds in early children and how the nature-nurture paradigm impacted children. Bowlby studied the exact same attachment concept, but from a slightly different angle. He focused more on the social impacts of attachment and the role of attachment issues in group behavior. For this reason, when we look at the workplace, we will focus a little more on Bowlby. And that's because, uh, I mean, yeah, Bowlby's different focus was on the social impacts and not so much the um the development in children and you know well in the workplace you got adults not children as noted in the quotation at the outset of this chapter bowelby summarized attachment behavior as crucial for maintaining a specified relationship as he evolved his research he went on to note that as Adults grow into effective individuals with healthy attachments, they will develop a healthy response to loss, which he defines as the successful effort of an individual to accept both that a change has occurred in his external world and that he is required to make corresponding changes in his internal representational world and to reorganize and perhaps to reorient his attachment behavior accordingly. Bowlby developed an overarching view of attachment behavior that he characterized as attachment behavior is conceived as being a distinct form of behavior and is equivalent to those other forms of instinctual behavior that enhance survival. Attachment behavior is attachment behavior in healthy development leads 
to affectional bonds, initially between a child and parent, and later between an adult and another adult. The goal of attachment behavior is to maintain proximity to or connections with the preferred attachment figure. Very intense emotions are involved during the formation, maintenance, disruption, and or renewal of attachment relationships. Attachment behavior contributes to individual and species survival. Attachment behavior is potentially active throughout life, and when active in an adult, it is not an indication of pathology or regression. In this last bullet, Balbi offers that attachment is potentially active throughout life, quote unquote. As Judith Crowell et al. note, although Balbi and Ainsworth clearly acknowledged the importance of the attachment system across the lifespan, they provide relatively few guidelines concerning its specific function and expression later in life. Subsequent work by several researchers provides superior guidance in the application of attachment behavior to adults and evidence of attachment behavior in adults. We have collectively published extensively our own research findings on attachment behavior in adults across organizations of all types around the world. Whether we like it or not, our reaction to loss as adults is not that biologically different from that baby at a party. When a very young child cannot find a parent, it triggers the mechanism called anaclic, anaclitic, anaclitic, anaclitic depression, anaclitic depression, which we tend to call separation anxiety. I was just about to say, could, can we just call it something else? Separation anxiety and anaclitic, anaclitic. Should I find the definition for that right now? Bear with me. Just a moment. What? Anaclitic means. <laughs> of, relating to, or characterized by the di direction of love toward an object, such as the mother, that satisfies non-sexual needs, such as hunger. Hmm. <laughs> Another one, anaclitic. Leaning or depending on, in psychoanalysis, relating to the dependence of the infant on the mother or mother substitute. Yeah, also see anaclitic depression, anaclitic depression, which we tend to call separation anxiety. When the child cannot find the primary caretaker, the emotional side of the intuitive brain takes over involving excessive interpersonal concerns, including feelings of loneliness, weakness, helplessness, and abandonment fears. The same is true for an adult. When an adult loses an attachment of value, we will show observable symptoms of these feelings of loss that mirror the executive emotional systems we explored in chapter two. Systems, symptoms, sorry. Symptoms of the individual, frustration, apprehension or anxiety, rejection of the environment, withdrawal, refusal to participate, and delayed development. Imagine an adult loses his phone. Uh-oh. Let me take a quick drink. Uh-oh. He may be frustrated. He may be a little anxious. He may refuse to be a part of the meeting until he can find his phone. Fucking. <laughs> he may ask his colleagues if they have seen it. He may not do any work at all until he can find his phone. No, he may need to take the rest of the day off. He may need to take off. Yeah, was, hold on. No, he may need to take off the rest of the day to go and find his phone. All of this while his open computer sits in front of him with the same functionality. Why? He's talking about Apple, by the way. That's what it sounds like. Because you can do the same shit on an Apple computer than you can on your on your Apple phone. I, myself, am actually Team Android. Imagine that. Team Android. Why? Because there ain't a lot I'm doing on my phone. I'm doing a lot more on, uh, on tablets or notepads or, or laptops. 
staying mobile, staying mobile. I just use the phone for a very precursory, very, very preliminary, preliminal, preliminary, or cursory. Damn, I hacked like two or three words together. I'm doing very like preliminary research, very cursory work on a phone. Maybe just taking notes. All of this will happen. All of this, his open computer, all of this, I'm adding of. All this while his open computer sits in front of them with the same, which, what am I tired? Is my brain, my brain got thrown off by that drink of water? All this while his open computer sits in front of him with much the same functionality. Why? Because it is his phone. That object matters. We have all seen it before and it demonstrates how these symptoms can play out for an individual that has lost an object of importance. The adult begins seeking a primary attachment response for the object. This is a comfort center that is the type of comfort they sought as a child. Just like the child seeking a comfort object, adults can be calmed using objects. These objects may evolve over time and they will vary. Some adults are comforted by people and some are comforted by physical objects. Some are comforted by processes or information. Imagine a different scenario where a woman loses her phone. A colleague immediately realizes her panic and decides to support her. The colleague calls her phone. It is not ringing, but together they try an app from her computer to find the phone. That does not work, but they agree that after the meeting, they will look together and perhaps contact the cell company about the prepaid insurance to get a new phone. Because there was a comforting object walking through, walk, hold on. Because there was a comforting object walking her through her responses, she did not devolve into frustration, reject the environment, or do herself a professional disservice. In short, the introduction of a comforting object helped her regulate her emotional systems in a time of loss. Getting stuck at work? Question mark. By now, we hope the connection of these concepts to the workplace is apparent. If adults have attachment behaviors, we also bring them to work. We may want to pretend that our behavior is rational in the moment that we cross some imaginary threshold from home to work, but it simply does not happen. Instead, our instead the intuitive brain and our attachment behavior moves with us through the doorway where we enter the working world. What comes with it is our set of attachments formed by our earliest days of life. It reveals itself in our daily work through simple things like our daily habits and our interactions with team members. In the late 1980s, research began to move beyond intimate relationships and demonstrate a strong connection to attachments with the challenges of everyday life. It is only over the last 20 years that the pl that the pace apologies. It is only over the last 20 years that the pace of dedicated research on attachments in the workplace has significantly quickened. Additionally, the growing popular literature around habit formation hits on the importance of attachment behavior. Habits are simply a repeated practice or routine. In 1989, Stephen Covey's number one national bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, defines a habit as the intersection of knowledge, skill, and desire. Knowledge is the theoretical paradigm, the what to do and the why. Skill is the how to do and desire is the motivation, the want to do. In order to make something a habit in our lives, we have to have all three. Creating a desire is about getting ourselves in a position where we are either willing to break an existing mental model or establish a new mental model. For this, there must be an emotional connection with the purpose of creating the new habit long enough for the mental model to stick. Of course, 
the flip side of getting a new habit to stick is when we get stuck. This is often called resistance. Resistance is a real challenge in organizations, but as we will discuss at a few points in this book, sometimes resistance is rational. Even more often, resistance is the attachment symptoms of the individual coming out in response to a perceived or actual change. The person is stuck. The organization decides to make a change to one of the very elements that the employee grew to lean on for support in their daily work, a system, a process, a person, or an idea. Now, instead of freely giving up that item, the team members' reaction is to dig in and say, no, I will not change, in quotes. Under the surface, that person is really feeling the symptoms of attachment. As Dr. Jerry Harvey notes, the same attachment mechanism carries over from adult life into the work world. Being abandoned by, ostracized by, or separated from individuals whom we know and lean on is an experience that frequently has a devastating impact on our lives. Likewise, being ostracized by, separated from, or abandoned by cherished organizations, many of whose members we may not know personally can generate the anaclytic, the anaclytic, anaclytic depression blues. Anaclytic depression blues. I keep wanting to say, I keep stumbling on that word, and I want to say ana, anaclimactic, like it, like because it's followed up by depression. So I want to make it like underwhelming. Anaclimactic depression. It's like an underwhelming depression. Like the shit was just just wasn't satisfying the shit just like it didn't it didn't hit the right way you know but no anaclytic anaclytic deals more with that immediate attachment to a person a place or a thing and uh, it's it's more related to love so it, it's like a loving relationship it's like a loving attachment to a person place or a thing and the anaclyt anaclytic depression is that depression that comes from the separation of that person, place, or a thing to which we have an emotional, quote unquote, emotional or a love bond to. Continuing, continuing. Our team member is frustrated that she is being asked to do something new, work with someone new, or use a new system. She is a little nervous about it. She may withdraw from her work and she may initially step back from participation. This will hinder her ability to work and advance. In short, she will resist. It may not be logical. In fact, it may be counter to her own interests. But if she is feeling like something will be lost, it is biological. In the book Switch, the Heath brothers, Chip and Dan, describe the brain via a parable of two parts involving a rider, and an, uh, involving a rider on an elephant. The writer represents our rational side that can see what is happening in the world around us and understands logically what to do to change. The elephant represents the emotional side, the intuitive brain that gets stuck. The Heath brothers also note the need for an emotional connection to quote unquote motivate the elephant by quote unquote finding the feeling to move the individual in the right direction. As they explain, only when you bring together the logical and rational writer with the intuitive and emotional elephant can you, quote unquote, build habits that will lead to the new behavior sought by the organization. This is the power and the challenge of getting stuck. We want to develop our workplace to leverage the intuitive brain to support our team members and employees in an organization. We want them to build the effective habits of the organization that will drive support it that will drive support individual development and growth so that will drive support there's there's a comma missing in there cuz that sentence is fucked up we want them to build effective habits of the organization that will drive support comma individual development and growth while supporting then there's supposed to be another comma in there. Maybe one comma? Or maybe just one more comma. L let me read it. 
monotonously to find if uh, there's an issue with that. We want them to build the effective habits of the organization that will drive support, individual development, and growth while supporting organizational productivity. That will drive su- what? Drive support. Maybe maybe there's a uh, maybe a slash between the drive and the support. Drive slash support, or drive and support. Drive and support individual development and growth while supporting. Yeah, I think that's it. But that's a that's a run on the fuck sentence. Run on and compound because peep game. It still has another comma and a but. We want them <laughs> to build the effective habits of the organization that will drive support, individual development, and growth while supporting organizational develop. Let me do that one more time. We want them to build the effective habits of the organization that will drive support, individual development, and growth while supporting organizational productivity, but we don't want that emotional side to get stuck. We want the emotional side to remain flexible enough to be re-engaged and motivated in a new direction if the organization needs to move in a new direction in, or in a different direction. It was a different direction. I, I, I swapped it out with new because it made sense. Let me reread it though because, you know, for the sake of integrity... We want the emotional side to remain flexible enough to be re-engaged and motivated in a new direction if the organization needs to move in a different direction. For each person, that is a complicated dance. It requires attachment to a set of core elements that remain constant while many things around the person may change. It is like tying one's attachments to a drainpipe while a tornado happens around you. It's like finding a Joshua. <laughs> yeah, like finding a Joshua. Okay. As we learned in chapter two, we come to work with a brain that is focused on survival first, and we use mental models to support our way through the world. In this chapter, we find that attachment is like one of those mental models, but more powerful. Attachment is not based on logic and reason to help us physically navigate the world, but rather emotions and memory. The attachment process is co-located in limbic system in the... Hold on, hold on. It's missing a the. The attachment process is co-located in the limbic system of the intuitive brain, where it is connected to our emotional systems and our response to situations that challenge our attachments will be reactive, biological, and emotional. These reactions will demonstrate the symptoms of loss. And yet, we have all found ways to navigate through the world and regulate these emotional processes. We can never replace our first caretaker, but we can lean on objects throughout our life to support us. These objects serve as proxies to help us regulate our emotions. Through different attachment objects, we can manage our emotional systems and effectively regulate the unending process of change that happens around us. Each of us has a different way of regulating these emotional processes called attachment styles. We will explore these in the next chapter. It is the combination of our unique attachment style and attachment objects, chapter 5, that determine how we behave in the workplace and how often we get stuck. Uh, Before we go into the practical exercises in this gray box, just a quick note. Yes, I understand that this book was published in 2022, but I'm going to give the authors and the editors the benefit of the doubt that because it's it's 2022, they want to get this edition of the book out into the market and just get the idea out into the universe, into this, this, this sphere of behavioral, behavioral development and professional development. And maybe, (laughs) you see the maybe, I had to emphasize the maybe because I mean, they're supposed to, you know, proofread the shit, man, before it goes to the market, it's got typographical and grammatical errors. 
But I'm not going to hold it against them because even myself as a professional, a consummate professional, understand that in the end, we're simply human and human error happens. I get it. I get it. Practical exercises. Reflect. Identifying Mel and Melanie. Attachment starts a birth and is a constant process. What? A attachment starts at birth. You see what I'm saying? Motherfucking typographical error right there. It's supposed to be at, not a. Attachment starts at birth and is a constant process of connecting and reconnecting throughout life. To understand our attachments a little better, it is important to understand some of our early attachments. These stick in the intuitive brain where memory, emotion, and learning come from or come together. Shit, I fucked that one up. These, <laughs> my intuitive brain filled in the blanks. These stick in the intuitive brain where memory, emotion, and learning come together. An easy mnemonic device to remember this concept is M-E-L. So a way to think about this for you is to think about identifying your Mel or Melanie. The following questions are designed to help you think about your Mel or Melanie. What attachments formed in your truth and the following questions are designed to help you think about your Mel or Melanie. What attachments formed in your youth and how these may or may not influence you today? Damn, maybe that was uh, subconscious, like an unconscious saying of your truth because, you know, having gone through modern day institutions, something sooner or later is bound to be tainted by, you know, watered down knowledge and curricula your truth doesn't exist. It's just the truth, people, okay? The truth. But I fucked that one up by by uh, blanking out on your youth. What attachments formed in your youth and how these may or may not influence you today? Who is the first person you remember caring for you as a child? How do you think about this person? Do you think about them favorably, negatively, do you ever compare people in your life to this person? If so, how do you ever explain this connection to the person? Do they understand why you view them this way? What is the first object you remember being quote unquote yours as a child? What did it look like? How old were you when you got it? Who gave it to you? How long did you have it? Where is it now? Do you remember the first time that you felt lost, meaning you didn't know where you were and you lost track of a parent, caretaker in a public setting? How did you feel in that situation? How did you ultimately resolve the situation? Have you ever thought about that moment again? Who is the first person close to you that you remember losing to death? How did this person shape your life? How often do you think about this person now? Do you think about this person when others talk about losing someone they care about? Does anyone that you work with remind you about this person? As you work through these reflections, you will find a set of early memories that will serve as the core of your attachments today. The purpose is to get you thinking about these earliest memories. Sorry. The purpose is how... The purpose is to get you thinking about how these earliest memories may influence who and what you lean on for support today. The next exercise is to collect and analyze. Habits get stuck. As we discuss in this chapter, habit formation happens in a very similar way to the attachment process. Habits are often described as a positive, whereas attachments can have a negative connotation. Let's see if we can find some of the habits that we have, both positive and negative, that we could work with to help us understand our own attachments. In a chart like Table 3.1, list out your daily habits. 
These could be things at home like drinking coffee or walking the dog, or it could be more complicated like, hold on, hold on. Yeah, or it could be more complicated work activities like uploading certain files or tracking time. The point is to track some of your daily habits, those things you do every day. Then look at that list and think about why you do them and who they serve. Are the habits good for you, another person, or the organization? Or are they bad for you, another person, or the organization? Upon reviewing these habits, are any of these habits worth changing? What would it take to do that? And then another reflection. Something changed, part two. At the end of chapter one, we ask you to write down an example of a change at work. Take a moment to go back and read the notes you wrote down. It's okay, we will wait. I'm just reading, I'm not actually waiting. Now, thinking again about that change, did you or others have a negative reaction to the change? Based on the content of this chapter, do you think it is possible you or others felt any sort of loss during that period of your life? Was there some aspect of the change that took away something from you or others at work that you valued? If so, what do you think was taken away? What is a physical or an intangible object? If you were the one who felt the loss, which of the following best represents how you felt? Frustration, apprehension, rejection of the environment, withdrawal, refusal to participate, delayed development? Can you remember other times you felt this way? And then that's the end of chapter three. To keep this operation nonprofit, and I mean the Corporate Cowboys podcast, powered by Incorporating Associates, to keep it nonprofit, go ahead and visit our Patreon page. It's the Corporate Cowboy Podcast. You can sign up for different tiers. I believe there is a one, a three, and a five dollar tier, but there will be an exclusive twenty dollar tier. And you can uh, support the programming as well as the nonprofit mission of our organization. That is essentially professional development and social corporate innovation. There's an Instagram page if you haven't seen it. It's the Corporate Cowboys. It's The handle is Corporate Cowboys. The end is with a Z. Corporate Cowboys. Why? Because the original spelling, Corporate Cowboys, is uh, our backup page. We don't want to burn the backup, which has the correct spelling. And so we're going to go with you know a little bit of slanguage. We're going to go with a little slanguage for the, for the youth, I guess. We are trying to uh, throw out a wide net and have a large audience. So there are already working professionals that follow us. And they're going to be on an age, you know, they're going to be in their 20s and the 30s and their 40s and their 50s. But of course, we want to get our young scholars, our young aspiring professionals, if they seek to improve themselves, if they seek to become hitters on the payroll, I mean, you know, figuratively, <laughs> or you can DM us, <laughs> they want to develop professionally, they want to grow constantly. In, a, in their adulthood as a professional, then that's what the content is for. That's what this content is for. That's why it's in an audio book format. That way you don't have to read it and instead can just listen. That said, there's a Cash App, a Venmo, a, uh, a PayPal floating around. I'm, I'm sure you're smart. You can find it. All right. Have a great one. See you when you learn from us next time.